Today we're discussing Parsha Tzav. Tzav means the command to command. And as the Parsha begins, God tells Moses to command Aaron and his sons about how to do their job, how to conduct all the sacrifices in the Mishkan and later on in the temple. Um, well, you will say, hold on, hold on. We discussed that in Vaikra last week. Yes, that's true. Um, however, Vaikra was just a general explanation about the Karbanot and uh, uh, how, what they mean and what, what's, what it's all about. Here is an explicit instruction to the Kahanim how to do their job with the precise details for every type of a sacrifice, how to prepare it, how to go about it, how to conduct it and where and how it is consumed. It is very critical since even a minor deviation from the rules may result in immediate death, as we will learn later on. A fire must be constantly burning on the altar. It is the coin's responsibility to make sure it never goes out. And the coin must clean the ashes from the altar every morning. There we go, you know, everybody is equal. It's a, this is not the most glamour, glamorous job. And the Kahanim, the elite of the Jewish society, actually do it. Because this is what Hashem told them to do. The first day that the Kohen does his service, he brings a mincha offering of flour and oil. And the Kohen Gadol, high priest, brings every day, as every single day, he brings the same kind of offering. And this is what it starts from, the, serv the service starts from. Parts of certain karbanot are eaten by the Kahanim but they have to be eaten at the right time and nothing to be allowed to be left for the next day or so. Then Torah switches to the discussion of Thanksgiving offering, Karban Tada, brought by an, an individual who survived a perilous circumstance. What it could be, it could be a travel through the seas, you know, uh, going through dangerous waters and dangerous countries and dangerous places, travel through the desert. It could be a sickness, a disease, a surgery, a serious surgery. Um, it, today it could be air travel as well. So, and today we still do it. We have got a special Tada prayer. The Parsha then tells us of how Moses initiated Aaron and his sons to become the Kahanim, in basically into the service of the Mishkan, of the, of the Holy. As God told him to do in Parsha Tetzavech. And first Moses put on Aaron his special clothing and then he poured special anointing oil on the altar and on Aaron. And then he put uh, on the clothing on the Aaron's sons, um, their special uh, white clothing. And then Aaron and his sons brought a bull as a sacrifice upon the altar. As a matter of fact, actually Midrash says that this very bull, the first one, which is on the eighth day, um, they sacrificed when they were inaugurating the Mishkan. Uh, that bull was a corrective action, a correction for the sin of golden calf and the atonement and the forgiveness by Hashem to Aaron for basically for his participation in the whole affair. Uh, then Aaron and his sons would eat the meat of the korban, of the sacrifices, and they remained for seven days in the Mishkan. That was the preparational work, which is described in the in the Tzav uh, prior to inauguration of the Mishkan, which we will discuss 
discuss in the next Parsha Shemini. As we can see, the sacrifices were the central and integral part of Jewish life in the desert and later on during the first and the second temple times. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, in his article on Tzav Parsha, why civil, titled Why Civilizations Die, says the following. The great question raised by Tzav, which is all about different kinds of sacrifices, is not why were sacrifices commanded in the first place, but rather given how central they were to the religious life of Israel in the Temple times, how did Judaism survive without them? The short answer to that question is that overwhelmingly the prophets, the sages and the Jewish thinkers of the Middle Ages realized that sacrifices were symbolic enactments of the process, intellectual and spiritual process. Like for instance, uh, putting one's hands on the animal is like passing your soul, your animal soul, to it and then sacrificing it. So it's a process of mind, heart and deed that could be expressed in other ways as well, not only in sacrifices. We can encounter the will of God by Torah study, engaging in service of God by prayer, making financial sacrifices and contributing um, to uh, upkeep of the, of the synagogues or temples and contributing to charities. We could be uh, financing and or uh, conducting hospitality and so on, helping people, doing mitzvot. With the destruction of the Second Temple, Jews did not abandon the past. Even today, we still refer constantly to the sacrifices in our prayers, but they did not cling to the past. The Jews did not, you know, the Second Temple is gone. It was a huge tragedy, terrible event. But we didn't crumble. And nor did Jews take a refuge in irrational behavior. They, they were thinking through uh, to the future. And they created institutions like the synagogue and house of study and schools uh, that uh, could be built anywhere and sustain Jewish identity even in the most difficult conditions. This is not a small achievement. The world's greatest civilization have all in time become extinct. And this is what Rabbi Sachs is writing. For instance, the Mayans, the Aztecs, Khmer Empire, Roman Empire, and many, many others. While Judaism always survived despite our terrible history of adversity, persecution, and so on. In one sense, yes, that was surely divine presence and providence. But in another, it was the foresight of our sages, Hillel, Shammai, uh, like Yohan Berzakai and Hanina ben Doza, the rabbis, uh, who resisted the breakdown of Jewish traditions and created solutions of during their days to resolve the problems of tomorrow, of the future. They did not seek refuge in the irrational, like Mayans and the Khmer conducting human sacrifices. Huge! If there is a physical, archaeological evidence today that Mayans and Khmers conducted human sacrifices in incredible numbers. Why? Because they didn't 
they couldn't find solution to, solutions to their civilization problems. And all they were trying to do is to, to, to bribe the gods through human sacrifices. Basically, that's all it was. Our Jewish sages, as opposing to that, quietly built the Jewish future by creating the foundations of rabbinical Judaism, the Oral Torah, the Talmud. Surely there is a lesson here for Jewish people today. Plan generations ahead. Think at least 25 years into the future. Contemplate worst case scenarios. Ask what we would do if, if something terrible will happen. What saved the Jewish people was their ability, despite their deep and abiding faith, never to go into the irrational thought. And despite their lo loyalty to the past, to keep planning for the future. And this is how we survived through the centuries. And today we should and we will Despite our traditions, despite our knowledge of our history and our adhesion, adhesion to every word of the Torah, we still should plan for the future. Thank you very much. I will see you in the next parsha.